This episode is brought to you by the Regional Water Authority, which represents water providers serving 2 million people throughout the Sacramento region. With continuing drought throughout California and the West, it is more important than ever to be water smart by reducing the amount you water your lawn while continuing to water your trees. Lawns can take the stress and recover while trees can be lost forever. Trees are a crucial aspect of our healthy environment, providing us shade, habitat for fauna, and of course, oxygen. Be Water Smart wants to ensure our urban forest is around for generations to come. By stressing your water-thirsty lawns and allocating water to your trees, we can ensure this happens. BeWaterSmart.info has helpful tips on watering both mature and young trees. How do you know how much to water? Confused about how much mulch to apply and where it should go? No worries. With their helpful videos and step-by-step instructions, you will know exactly how to care for your trees. Did you know that young trees younger than five are at the most risk during the hot summer months? In conjunction with the Sacramento Tree Foundation, you can learn how to correctly water throughout the summer with the bucket method. No more worrying about if you water too little or too much. You can learn tips for efficiently watering trees, the latest landscape watering guidelines, information about rebates, and more at BeWaterSmart.info. That's BeWaterSmart.info. Look at that plant. I want you to know that everything was grown in my garden. Don't touch that plant! Is it poisonous? She'll become part of the plant. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Flower Power Garden Hour. I'm your host, Marlene, and with me again is Kevin Marini. Because we had such a good time talking last time, he's going to join me, and we're going to talk about compost. I'm super excited that he is an expert in compost. I've been wanting an expert composter on the podcast for a while. I've touched upon it on in different um, episodes, but this one's going to be all about the ins and outs of compost, all your questions answered. Uh, really, what is compost? How do you make compost? Why compost is good? And, you know, some of you might have seen those new, quote, machines that make instant compost. Is that a thing? So, Kevin, thanks for joining me again. Hey, thank you so much for the invitation again. I'm looking forward to talking about rotting stuff. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Isn't it like the the bumper sticker that says compost happens? So, yes, I yes. love that saying. I say that all the time. I figured you did. So um, just so people know, what what is your job title again? And how do you know about so much about compost? Sure, sure. So I work for the University of California Cooperative Extension um, in Placer and Nevada County. So most counties have an extension office through the university. We just happen to be an office that has two counties under our umbrella, Placer and Nevada counties. And I have managed uh, two master gardener programs, Placer County Master Gardeners, Nevada County Master Gardeners for about 20 years. In December, I'm going to have my 20-year anniversary. So I've been doing this for a very long time. And I, my actual phone line is called the Rot Line. Ooh. You heard that right. The Rot Line. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a composting hotline. And so for 20 years, I have been taking composting questions. Um you know, I, I had I had become obsessed with composting before I took this position, so I just didn't get thrown into the rot line. Um, but it's unbelievable the number and the type of questions I have gotten over all that time, and it has created just such a exciting thing for me, right? To get people calling me and asking me all these questions about rotting material. It's great. <laughs> okay, you're gonna have you, first of all. First of all, I, I love that you're like, I was excited about compost before. I could just see that on like a dating site. What are your interests? Composting, <laughs> rot. <laughs> yeah. But, Special type of date yeah. for that, right? You're like, ooh, that's exciting. A perfect match. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you're going to have to sort of just drop some of these crazy questions I'm sure people have asked you. So along the way, just you, you got to give us some. I mean, it's it's almost Absolutely. like it's almost like the the real composters of Nevada and Placer County, right? <laughs> Yeah. And I think that, you know, when people don't have a full understanding of it, then, you know, it may seem like an off the wall question, but it's coming from such a, a genuine standpoint of like, 
is is this you know dryer lint really compostable that sort of thing oh yeah I have no questions dumb trust me that's not yeah i'm just wondering what people are even thinking but oh i've had some pretty yeah. i've had i had some pretty outlandish thoughts myself about <laughs> compost like <laughs> huh i wonder if i could put that in there what would happen but um so let's sure. let's just start you know broad and go narrow and explain what is compost? So people go to the store and they see a bag labeled compost or they're told add compost. I know I'm guilty of it. I'm constantly telling people to add compost to their soil, to add nutrients, mulch with compost. But I don't think I, you know, I don't really tell everyone every single time what it is. And so what is compost? Great question. So um, you have all these things that or fall under the umbrella of organic materials. And basically organic materials refer to things that were alive and that have been dead for a very long time, alive and have been dead for just a very little amount of time, and things that are still living like microorganisms all over grass clippings. So those three things kind of make up organic materials. And in their raw form. And compost is the fully decomposed form of those materials over time. And so compost tends to look like soil. It's dark in color. It's crumbly. Um, it should smell good, kind of have this earthy smell. Now, I, I should probably say up front, I I say I um, suffer from OCD, obsessive composting disorder. <laughs> and so I tend to look at compost as, you know, smelling good and earthy. I totally understand if some people think, well, it's got its own funky smell, but <laughs> it shouldn't smell bad. Yes, but, but compared to something that's anaerobic, has like a oh. sulfur smell. That's not what we're oh, talking about. Yeah. Yes. No, no, no. Yeah. If you open up a bag of compost and it smells like ammonia mm -hmm. or rotten eggs, you do not want that product. Do not buy it. Good to know. Um, so, you know, the main thing with, with finished compost is that it really truly looks like soil in the sense that there shouldn't be chunks of organic materials that you can still recognize, right? So if you open up a bag of compost and there's actually recognizable leaves or, or wood chips or things like that, then you know that it hasn't been fully decomposed. And to be totally honest, there's a, there's a spectrum of compost quality out on the market, some very high quality, fully decomposed, sifted, very uniform, uh, totally mature. And then on the other end of the spectrum, not fully decomposed, chunks of things in there and smelling bad. So, you know, I, I do think you have to experiment a little bit. I mean, I hope everyone composts at home, but if you have to buy compost, you really maybe have to experiment with a couple of different brands to, to get one that you feel is high quality. Mm -hmm. it, and is, you know, some people may come across a bag that says, um, and I, humus, is that similar to compost? And I always have to, in my mind, go hummus, humus, humus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely have been at a few Master Gardener workshops over the years where they say that you want to make good hummus. And I still cream. have so to I say totally it. I still have to say it. I just ate some hummus, so I have to say hummus. Yeah. Hummus. <laughs> yeah, humus is a funny thing, okay? Because what what humus, I guess, scientifically mm -hmm. is supposed to be referring to is organic material that is fully broken down to the point where it's a stable aggregate in the soil. It no longer is going to break down any further. Okay. And so like humus formation takes a lot of time. And that's why when you go to, um, you know, the nursery and buy, say a product called Arctic humus, well, where does that come from? It's actually mined. It's dug out of the ground, out of these deposits that have been sitting there for a very, very, very long time. So you know, it's kind of interesting because I hear people talk about making humus in their backyard compost pile. And I think in the popular literature, that's everywhere. So it's understandable. But really, technically, humus is more of a, a long term decomposition of organic material. I think of compost in your backyard as being somewhere in the middle with plenty more to break down in the soil by organisms. Got it. Okay. That makes perfect sense. That actually helps me too. I didn't know the scientific, um, but of course anyone can label anything what they want. So 
Just be cautious. Absolutely. Just be cautious of that out there. So why why is why is compost good? I mean, I I know why it's good. Um, mm-hmm. and people are told to use it, and you just told us what it is. But is, is it a substitute for fertilizer? Does it give the nutrients to the soil? Will it help quote build your soil over time? Um, so why should people use it? And and more importantly, like you said, people should be making it on their own. Yeah, I think that, you know, I always tell people the best compost in the world can be made in your own backyard. You have the ability. It's it's quite empowering, in, in my opinion, <laughs> that <laughs> you can you can really create the good stuff in your own backyard. When you rely on purchasing it, I have to be honest, you're relying on uh, the process that went into making that product. And that may have been good or bad, and the end product may be good or bad. And if you have control over that process in your own backyard, you can really create good stuff. So that's the first part. Um, But really, when I think of composting as something important for people to consider doing, I think of it, number one, from an environmental perspective. So, you know, just in California this January, we had SB 1383, the food waste bill. And what it was, what it's trying to do is really deal with all the food waste organic material that we put in landfills, which causes all these problems. It causes methane production. It causes uh, has hazardous leachate, which is the drainage that comes out of landfills. Um, and it takes up space in our landfills. And if we can divert those organic materials that we're burying in underground into a composting situation, we can then create a good product with that stuff and not deal with these problems. So there is simply an environmental reason to do it. But as you and I know as gardeners, I mean, you re- you're creating something that makes your garden better through decomposing what a lot of people think of as waste. So it's kind of a huge win-win, right? You have this waste and instead of getting rid of it, you utilize it, turn it into something that you can actually improve your garden with. I don't think it gets much better for gardeners, really. Um, now, the re- what it actually does is it introduces life. So there's all these microorganisms in compost that get introduced into the soil environment when you add it to soil. So that's a huge benefit. It the, One of the biggest benefits is it helps improve the structure of the soil. So the structure has to do with how soil uh, particles aggregate, which really defines how the soil drains and how much balance there is between water and oxygen. And that's what compost can really do. Um, For example, I live up in the foothills and have, you know, pretty dense clay soil. And there's all these nutrients, mineral nutrients in my soil, but the problem is it doesn't drain well and there's not a lot of oxygen in it. So when I add compost to it, I can liberate all of those nutrients that are kind of stuck in there uh, and I get better drainage. I get better growing plants. Um, And so it's, again, just a huge win-win for gardeners. Um, And, but I don't want to leave out that environment, environmental perspective. Um, And probably finally, I should say that, you know, I'm a, I'm a compost nerd. So there's also just the awe factor. I mean, when you take all this, material and it turns into this beautiful finished compost i have to say it's it's wondrous <laughs> it, it is pretty amazing that you go from one thing that's you could you could identify each product to where it's just this big and it is beautiful and it does smell good um and thank you thank it, you for it, that. <laughs> <laughs> it does maybe you know i mean it, it, i mean I, I think people who smelled quote, good soil, good compost, or, you know, it's even good forest soil knows it smells good. It's, it's, um, has a distinct smell to it, but I like how you bring up the environmental point too. I mean, it's, it's all this stuff would go in our garbage cans to the, to the dump. It's put it back into the earth and make it work for you in in your garden. Um, if you can, I know space, you know, for a lot of people is, is an issue, but, you know, we'll talk about small small ways of doing it as well. Yeah, and, for sure. And I think the the one question that you asked that I didn't really answer was about the nutrients. And mm-hmm. one important thing to understand about compost is that there are nutrients in there. Don't get me wrong, mm-hmm. but um, you're, you're, you're using it 
not only for that. It, mm-hmm. it doesn't, you know, the University of California has publications that are research-based and according to the research, uh, compost, you know, will give you 10 to 15% of your nutrient needs in like an annual vegetable planting bed. That's, I, you can read that online and in the literature. But what I try to tell people is, don't stop there. It's not just about these nutrients. It's about all the other benefits to the soil environment. And what happens is you get better nutrient cycling in your soil, like I was talking about. So I can liberate those nutrients that aren't available to plants by adding compost. I'm not adding nutrients, a lot of nutrients from the compost itself, but by applying it, I'm increasing the soil's ability to cycle nutrients and to make them available. That's, That's important. That That is really important as well. And most compost is going to be acidic. And so it's also, you know, it, it's not going to increase your pH. And so if anything, it could drop your pH, which allows a lot of nutrients could be available too, if you're in a high pH area as well. So yeah, a lot of times, you know, the, the inputs that you put into the compost pile do have an effect on the ultimate pH of the compost. But also what's amazing is it it generally falls into a, a range that is, you know, relatively neutral to acidic, like you said. Uh, but you could put, you know, all these different materials in there with all these different pH values. And somehow nature has made it so that decomposition leads us to that range we kind of want mm-hmm. to grow plants in. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, that is pretty cool. It's, I, I don't know of anyone who's ever had a, a compost bin be alkaline. I just don't think that's yeah, no. <laughs> possible. So um, let's talk about where, um, before we get into, quote, the rules and the carbon nitrogen mm-hmm. ratio and what should go in it. Let's talk about some locations of where if someone has, say, a, a standard size backyard or where it would be the best spot. Should it be covered? Should it be in the sun? Should it be in the shade? Should it be go straight onto the ground? Should it go on cement? Where would be a good location for a compost bin? Great question. I here I'll give you a quick anecdote. So I got a call from a lady one time on the rot line, and <laughs> she was very distraught. And oh. she said, "Kevin, please tell me there's a way to get the stains out of my beautiful new patio that I put my compost pile on." And I said, "Wait, let me get this straight. You put a compost pile <laughs> on your brand new." patio made of pavers. And she said, yes. And when I removed it, it stained. Well, obviously I had no good answer for uh, bleach. Maybe, I don't know, new pavers. (laughs) Um, So one thing I could tell you for sure is do not put it on something (laughs) that you want to maintain (laughs) because it is likely to leach and stain whatever material, like, you know, composite type material you put it on. So I always recommend putting it on the earth itself. Yeah. So uh, you're not worried about that sort of thing. Um, yeah, she was very disappointed that I didn't have a good answer for it. Oh, she should call, can't, can't yeah. figure that one out. <laughs> she, should, she should call the guy who put the patio in. I'm sure he has a way of cleaning yeah. pavers. And actually, the <laughs> exactly. sun does wonders. The sun over time will bleach, probably bleached it out. I don't know. That yeah, you're probably right about life. that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I tell people, put it on the earth mm-hmm. and... I like to I like to put some coarse materials or at least like use a fork and 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 kind of score the earth so that you have some air and some drainage capability there at the bottom mm-hmm. of the pile. Um, you know, whether you put it in the sun or shade has has a, impacts on on your ability to manage the pile seasonally. So let me explain. Mm-hmm. So in the summer up here or you know down there in Sacramento, um you know, it's, we get over a hundred degrees all the time. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a compost pile in the sun and you're trying to keep it moist, that can be a challenge. It can dry out extremely fast. So in the summertime, it makes more sense if, if it's shaded and so that you maintain that moisture. And conversely in the winter time, when we get rain, um, if you have it out in the sun, well, that may help evaporate a drenched 
saturated pile from a rainstorm, right? So that may be a good thing in the winter, whereas in the summer, not so good. Mm -hmm. um, so I look of it, I look at it more seasonally as far as whether or not you place it in the sun or shade. I usually tell people place it near a water source because you do need to keep compost piles moist. You know, a dried out compost pile becomes just a, a home for some critter. You know, you, you pile stuff up and then you let it all dry out. Something's going to move in there. Mm -hmm. um, most likely rodents or you know, in my case up here, rattlesnakes. Oh, um, gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so moisture is absolutely necessary for decomposition. So, you know, the worst thing you could possibly do is build a compost pile and then let it completely dry out. Um, then it just becomes a critter home. Mm -hmm. um, so near a water source, sunshade, depending on you know how much effort you're going to put into managing it and monitoring it. Um, you know, and, and probably it's probably a good idea to keep it away from structures. Yes. There's yes. only been one documented, you know, spontaneous combustion that I know of in California. I know it was a long time ago. Um, but it just, it, if you are creating a hot compost pile and getting it up to 140, 150 degrees um, and it's steaming, you probably want to keep that away from structures just to be safe. Um, so those would be my pointers for location. Okay. And I always think, you know, just on the ground and I understand if people, it's like when you get a, a truckload of soil or something, you want to get every single goodness out of that pile. So if you put it on a hard surface, you could scrape it up. But in so the true. ground, you already have, if you have earthworms, you've already got the earthworms there that are going to come up and work for you. Some of the microorganisms in the soil come up and join the compost bin for a big party. Um, I totally agree. And yeah. if you move your compost bin after a few years, that's sometimes the best place for a new garden or a new plant is right there because some of that compost has worked its way down in. So, um, Oh yeah. And I'm pretty sure most people who have composted for years have had the, the random pumpkin plant or <laughs> squash plant grow out of it. And Potatoes. it looks like the healthiest, most <laughs> beautiful plant ever, right? I know. And then you try to get them to grow and you're like, huh, oh, they're doing better when I just throw them in my compost bin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Very true. Yeah. Um, okay. So some of the rules of composting there there's, and, and how strictly do people have to adhere to this? Cause this might be the part where people are like, oh, I messed up or, Ooh, this is too much. Like, uh, you know, I have to think too much and they just want to throw things out in there. So we, we're talking about the carbon and nitrogen ratio and, and just tell me what the carbon is, what nitrogen is, what the ratio is, some materials that, uh, and then how should they be in your compost pile? Let me tell you, this is super important because in all these years of teaching composting, even though what I'm going to say sounds basic and self-explanatory, People get really hung up on this. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, in the literature, it talks about browns and greens. So you take any organic material that exists out there, and it should fall into one of these camps, either browns or greens. And that's just, I don't know who came up with that. That is just in the popular literature as far back as I can go back with composting. Now, the problem is it doesn't actually refer to the color of the materials. And I think that's where people get confused. Mm. So what you said is true. It refers to the carbon to nitrogen ratio mm -hmm. of the material. And there's no way that an individual could intuitively know the carbon to nitrogen ratio. So science has provided us with um, lists of materials and their carbon to nitrogen ratio. But what we've done in locally to to make this simple for uh, people learning about composting is basically throw the carbon to nitrogen ratio out the window okay. and, and go with what we say equal volumes of greens and browns. So before we talk more about that, let's define what these greens and browns are. Well, if every organic material falls into either camp, what characterizes those camps? So brown materials have been dead a long time. They no longer have nitrogen in them. They no longer have moisture in them. So think of like brown pine needles, dried out leaves, dried straw, and newspaper and cardboard fall into this category as well. So just dried out, long-term long dead materials uh, are your brown materials. 
your green materials are fresh. So even though they may have been dead for a little while, they still are full of moisture and they're still full of nitrogen. So the examples that I give for greens are fresh grass clippings, fresh plant prunings, animal manures. That's where the color thing gets screwy yeah. a little bit because obviously fresh animal manure is colored brown, but it's firmly in the green camp. <laughs> um, coffee grounds fall into the greens. Another one that's colored brown, but isn't a brown, it's a green. And so these materials, you know, the moisture content of them usually clue people into what's a green and what's a brown. And that's a good way to look at it. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So, so there's lots of materials that have carbon to nitrogen ratios that, that make them somewhere in the middle, right? So you have like fresh chicken manure, which is, has a ton of nitrogen in it, but for example, fresh cow manure has less. And so there's a spectrum of nitrogen content in greens, and there's a spectrum of carbon content in the browns. And so you know, it's not absolute, but in general, you have to look this up. If you're wondering, is this a green or this a brown? Look it up or call the rot line and I can help you. <laughs> um, but you're not going to necessarily intuitively know unless you just go by, is this moist and relatively fresh versus is this dry and has been dead for a long time? <laughs> okay. All right. So I like the, I like the moisture content because I think it, I think it, I think things like the coffee grounds and the manures are definitely going to confuse people on that because the color is very distinct. I mean, if you have green manure, then eh, you, you may want to check your animal. But <laughs> but of course, you know, I guess horse manure sometimes could be green, I think. Sometimes I has some kind yeah. of grassy material in there. Sure, exactly. sure. Yeah. But firmly in the green category, yes. so you're saying. Yes, yes. Okay, so um, you're just saying equal parts. If you go about... Yeah, so, well, let's be clear here. So... This is gets a little tricky because it's okay. equal volumes. Equal so volumes. What, okay. what we use as a visual is a five gallon bucket. Most people have have a five gallon bucket or at least know what a five gallon bucket looks like. And I actually use and still use five gallon buckets to make compost piles. Hmm. And the reason why is it keeps me on point for those equal volumes. So for example, you have a, a bu five gallon bucket full of greens. Well, greens are heavy and dense because they're wet, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you fill that up to the top, there's hardly gonna be any air in that five gallon bucket. It's gonna be heavy and filled of green materials. On the other side, if you have a five gallon bucket full of browns and you haven't smashed them down to the point where no more can fit in there, you're going to have a lot of air in there, right? If you just pile it up to the top without smashing it down. So what I tell people is make sure that brown bucket has as much that you can possibly compress into it, then you have equal volumes. And, and what happens is if you dump those on the ground, the green pile looks a lot smaller than the brown pile, about a two to one ratio to the eye, because there's all this air with the browns, right? It's all, it's light and fluffy. It's not dense like the greens. So the five gallon buckets really help me at least, and I've heard from others, it helps them keep the equal volumes going. Interesting. I love that. I mean, I think that's, that's, you know, people who are starting a compost or like you said, you still use it. It's, it's going to give people the gauge of it and everyone could just put something in a bucket, squish it down and then dump it in there. Um, and so yeah. that's, that's, that's a great way of going, going about it. Um, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to try that. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, a lot of times in the literature, you, um, you read about making a compost pile, pile like a cake. Mm -hmm. And so it talks about a layer of greens and a layer of browns. And in, in the graphics, it looks like it's exactly the same amount of, you know, material in each layer and you're making this cake. And I tell people that's really not the way you want to build a compost pile. I take that five gallon bucket of greens and that five gallon bucket of browns, mix them together water it down, make sure it's, it's evenly uniform moist. And that is a layer. So a layer is really, you know, greens and browns mixed together. You never want to have a layer of green and a layer of brown or lay because the microorganisms want both materials together so they could utilize them. So that's an important point right off the bat. Can you make a compost pile too big or too small? 
Well, you you can't really make it too big. If okay. you go to say, uh, you know, some of these facilities that do large scale composting, they have these these um, things called windrows, which are probably twenty feet high, twenty feet wide, and a football field long. Oh, geez. And so mm-hmm. those are enormous, huge tracks of of compost piles, right? Um, now, there is a minimum size if you want to create hot compost. Okay. So there's really kind of two ways to compost, the, the cold method or the hot method. And so the hot method requires that you at least have three by three by three um, size so that you have enough surface area to host enough organisms to actually create heat. Mm -hmm. So the heat from the pile is coming from the activity of the organisms decomposing it. And so when you take that thermometer, you're kind of measuring the microbial activity in a sense of the pile. And so when you have, let's say, if somebody said, I can make a hot compost pile in a shoebox, it's against the laws of physics. (laughs) Like you just, you can't, have enough surface area for enough organisms to actually create measurable heat. So if you want hot compost, you at least have to have a three by three by three. I will tell you this in all the hundreds of compost piles I've built, I have found that a five by five by five breaks down hot compost breaks down to about a wheelbarrow full of finished compost. (laughs) Wow. So um, mm-hmm. the shrinkage is unbelievable. So if you want a decent amount of compost, I always tell people start with five by five by five. Okay. So you mentioned hot compost, but then you're saying cold compost. What's mm-hmm. what's the difference? Well, <laughs> it's interesting because all these years I've I've come to the realization that the overwhelming majority of people do not do hot compost. Hmm. I would say probably, you know, 90% of folks are doing cold composting. And so what's the difference? Well, with hot compost, because you need to have that larger size of a pile to start with, you have to have a lot of material. So you have to have all the greens and all the browns to build at one time a nice big three by three by three pile or bigger. Okay. Mm -hmm. And not many people have that situation. They, they, have some uh, fruit and vegetable scraps from their kitchen. Mm. They maybe have some grass clippings once a week or, you know, so they're just adding to a compost pile willy nilly, right? Whatever they got, they throw it in there. So that in that sense, you're not going to really create a hot compost pile. Now, some of my master gardeners disagree with me and feel (laughs) that there's a third way. If you don't have all the materials to make a hot pile, but you really want to get some heat, maybe you build up that cold pile over time. And when it's pretty big in size, you make sure you have enough green material in there to start creating that heat. And so some master gardeners that I've uh, talked to say, I've just built it up over time. I don't have it all at once. And so that may be kind of a middle ground if someone really wanted to try to hot composting, but didn't have all the materials that at one time. Um, There's nothing wrong with cold composting. Mm -hmm. Um, I usually say work backwards with composting. So what's your goal? If like, I'll give an example of my parents, they're not gardeners. And so, but they do want to recycle organic materials instead of sending them to the landfill. Mm -hmm. And so they could kind of care less about how fast the process goes. So a cold pile works perfect for them. Um, They don't have a huge need. They're not you know, crazy gardeners like we are. And so they don't have a huge need for the finished compost. They just want to recycle it. And so in that sense, um, if that's their goal, they create a system, a backyard bin, for example, that's out of the way and aesthetically kind of pleasing. (laughs) And, you know, that works for them. But for me, I'm a four season vegetable gardener and I want compost all the time. And so I'm going to actually seek out materials so that I can build these hot compost piles, which go quickly and provide me with a decent amount of compost consistently through the year. So it's really what's your goal and then tailor the system to your goal. Okay. So when you build your five by five compost pile, that's it. You've built it because you've had enough materials. Because if you do do a lot of gardening, it's actually pretty easy to get a five by five pile. Um, And so then you just leave that there and that's your compost pile that you'll manage. And then you'll start another five by five one versus the cold one, what sounds like people who don't have enough material just slowly add to it until they get that five by five. 
Um, so you never, so once you build a compost, you don't really add to yours or. Very true. So okay. Only in the sense of a hot compost. Pot. Got it. So, okay. So, you know, I'm, I'm OCD. So I have a hot, a, co- a cold and five other kinds, you know, <laughs> but um, for in, ge- in general, the best way to do hot composting is to build it and treat it as a batch and let it, Got and then it. you turn it once a week, you monitor the moisture slowly but surely it starts to break down um you start to see materials kind of disappear if you will and and within you know a two month time period you could potentially have a nice wheelbarrow full of finished compost ready um that doesn't mean that you may not also have a cold pile for the meantime where Mm -hmm. you're still producing materials but you're just kind of putting them on top Mm -hmm. of a cold compost pile the absolutely crucial thing for composting is that you adhere to the equal volumes of greens and browns, no matter what you're doing. And this is the big problem I see over and over again. A lot of folks build build a compost pile, buy a compost bin, sorry, um, outside. Mm -hmm. And what they do is they collect their food scraps in a little compost counter Mm -hmm. uh, crock, if you will, and go out and do something that I call dump and run. where you go out and you dump the bucket and you run back in the house. And what happens is, is those are all greens. And so every week, if you do that, you're just throwing greens by themselves in a pile, which will lead to a stinky, anaerobic, Mm -hmm. fly infested, gross pile of stink. I'm smelling it and seeing it right now. (laughs) Yeah. So the key is when you go out and dump that, you also have some browns, either some stockpile dried leaves in a garbage bag, a bale of straw, some newspaper, some cardboard that you shred up that you put on at the same time. And therefore, you're as it builds, you're keeping the equal volumes. You're adding greens and browns still. So even if you're not doing a batch, a hot compost pile, you still want to have greens and browns available. And that's why it's nice with browns to be able to, you know, use newspaper or Mm -hmm. cardboard or dried leaves. Most people can find that stuff pretty easy. Yeah, it used to be newspaper was easy to come by. Now it's all the Amazon boxes, cardboard boxes. So true. So true. This day and age, you have way more cardboard than newspaper. Um, So you mentioned watering once a week. And is that year round? Obviously, when it's raining, it's not. Should you cover to prevent too much water? Um, and then do you turn it every time you water it? So let's focus first on the hot compost. Okay. Because right? like I said, we've mm-hmm. built this pile. We've we've taken our five-gallon buckets of greens and browns, and we keep building this pile until it's, you know, let's say five by five by five. Um, and as you've been adding the greens and browns, you've been watering to make sure everything stays moist. Well, now you've built it. Okay. So the first step, from that point forward is to check on it. And you check on it, we say weekly, okay? Because a lot of people think that, oh, composting takes too much time, it's too much effort. I look at it as just a weekly chore once you've built the pile. Um, and that weekly chore is to go out and, you know, take some, some, turn the pile, add oxygen to the pile in some way, shape or form. And so this can be done in many different ways. Yes, you can physically turn the pile with like a garden fork. Mm -hmm. You can also use um, what they have these big, huge augers that you put on drills. Like they're like a huge drill bit. You can drill your compost pile if you want to avoid having to physically turn it over. Oh, I like Mm -hmm. that. Yeah. They have these tools called compost aerators, which are kind of a T-shaped tool with hinges on the bottom that fold up. So when you plunge it into the pile, the hinges fold up, but then when you yank it out, they unfold and kind of create these channels. Again, you're not completely turning over the material. Um, And then some people will add material in the pile itself to help keep it from going anaerobic. So for example, up here, we have sugar pines and they have these enormous sugar pine cones. Mm -hmm. And I have master gardeners that will strategically kind of place them in the pile as they're building them so that there's always these little air pockets that maintain aerobic um, conditions. That's pretty funny. Like spacers, pine cone spacers. (laughs) 
Yeah. And some people will use PVC pipe, you know, um, putting them perforated PVC pipe in the pile to help keep air being able to to okay. move into the pile and keep it aerated. People have gotten really creative with yeah. how to kind of passively aerate piles and not have to turn over that wet, heavy stuff, right? Yeah, because yeah, turning it over is, it's a chore. So I could see why people would be like, oh, I don't want to do that. So um, yeah, yeah, okay. So it's good to know that you don't so, ne- necessarily need to turn it over. It's just the idea is getting air inside of it. That's exactly right. Hmm. Over time, that pile starts shrinking which squeezes out oxygen and the organisms, all the microbes, the decomposers, they oxygen. So, but because of those two things going on, you have to, at some point, incorporate some oxygen or it's going to go anaerobic Mm -hmm. and then it's going to start to smell. Yeah. Odors from compost piles come from anaerobic low oxygen conditions. And so I say once a week, you go out there, you check for moisture. We say it should be moist as a wrung out sponge. So you should be able to grab some material in the pile, squeeze it and feel moisture, but a bunch of water shouldn't squeeze out of it. That would probably be too wet. Okay. Um, so moist as a wrung out sponge and somehow, some way incorporate oxygen on a weekly basis, check those two things. Um, and you'll be amazed how if you build the pile correctly with the equal volumes of greens to browns, you check weekly for air and water. It is pretty straightforward and pretty simple to get good high quality finished compost. Another factor is the size of the material itself. Mm -hmm. So the smaller the material, the more you can chop it up, the faster the process will go. Yeah. Cause I see people, you know, just throwing big, big logs in, um, big twigs in those aren't, those aren't going to break down. Um, <laughs> yeah, not quickly, yeah, not quickly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I've always wanted just a chipper, just one to chip up wood for like wood chips, but two also to just get everything small for a compost pile. That would be, you know, sort of uniform, but you could do it by hand, obviously. It's just don't put giant things in there, expect them to, to break down at the same size or time. Yeah. I mean, it, even just like if, if you think of a pile of, you know, just brown wood chips, mm-hmm. you know, they sit around for years, right? Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, those big chunks of things will, even in a hot pile, probably take multiple piles to fully break down. Um, so, you know, some people will will chop things up with chipper shredders, like mm-hmm. you mentioned. Um, I, I know this isn't ideal, but I do use my lawnmower with a catch bag. So I'll pile material kind of in a little row and then I'll run over it with my lawnmower. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the only downside to that, of course, is um, you dull your lawnmower blade very quickly. That's what I was going to say. You're going over some pretty harsh things. Well, I'm already guilty of it. Mine probably won't even cut because the things I go over with my lawnmower. Sh- exactly. We don't talk yeah. about. So you become really good at, at sharpening it or just simply <laughs> replacing it over time. Yeah. Cause I don't even have grass. It just goes over weeds and whatever other stuff. <laughs> it's, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Um, so should people be taking a, a temperature reading or should they just assume if they're doing everything right, it's breaking down, you might see, or you should see steam coming off of it or is a thermometer temperature check a good idea? You know, I really feel that if you're going to go to the effort to really create hot compost, um, get a thermometer. It's, okay. it's going to make you, it's going to, you know, stroke your ego a little bit. <laughs> you're going to, it's really um, satisfying to go out there when you see a little bit of steam where you mm-hmm. put your hand over the pile and you feel some heat to really see the temperature. Mm-hmm. And to be totally honest, there is a scientific uh, way to manage a compost pile by taking its temperature. So at these large facilities, when you take a temperature reading and it's continuing to go up or stay stable, that means that there's enough oxygen in the pile. As soon as the temperature drops, that means that the organisms have used up the oxygen or the pile itself has displaced the oxygen to the point of the temperature going down, the population declining temperature goes down. That would be your cue to turn the pile or aerate it. Interesting. So you actually, okay. if you were really, really geeky, mm-hmm. you could yeah. use temperature as a, as a way to tell you exactly when to turn the pile. Okay. So no, I mean, it is an indicator of what's going on. 
So absolutely, okay. yeah. And, 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 a mo- and believe it or not, maybe a moisture meter mm-hmm. um, would help people monitor moisture good too. Yeah. Uh, what I mean, are we going to just go in and get the turkey thermometer, a candy thermometer? Do they have compost thermometers? I know I would just take the one from the kitchen because I'd be like, "What am I using this for in here?" So yeah. they, oh, they definitely sell compost thermometers, and they're a little bit unique. <laughs> Because they have a very long probe. So you've probably seen a soil thermometer before. They only have, you know, six inch probe, but a compost thermometer can be up to 18 inches. And so Mm -hmm. you get a much more accurate reading of the pile because the highest heat is actually kind of in the center Mm -hmm. of the pile, the heart of the pile. Yeah. Uh, When do people, I mean, when do you know you could use it in getting the most out of it? Um, It's broken down enough. I mean, do you, is there a temperature reading? Is it sort of the look you described what compost is early on? Um, should it just be that nice, loose, fluffy, good smelling substrate? Yeah, I, 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 all of the above. Okay. So I think you use everything at your disposal to figure out when the compost is mature. You, it should not be hot anymore. If it's still creating hot temperatures, then it's, it's still cooking. And so, you know, I always tell people never buy compost from somewhere where you see steam coming off of it because it's still super hot and it hasn't matured yet. So, you know, that's one way to know is literally taking the temperature and watching for it to, to drop to the point where it doesn't rebound. So say it drops to 80 degrees and then you turn it and nothing happens. Well, you, that pretty much means that it's done cooking or it needs more green material maybe to finish it off because there's some stubborn, like you said, sticks or twigs mm-hmm. or something like that. Um, so that's one way to do it, but also using your eyes, looking at it, seeing if, if the material is fully broken down, using your nose, making sure that it smells good and earthy and you're not smelling um, ammonia or those rotten egg smells that could mean that it's still cooking or that it's going on anaerobic or, you know, something else is going on. Um, So, and I usually tell people to, you know, pick some up and get, get it in your hands and Mm -hmm. feel it. Is it crumbly? Is it, is it nice and moist? Do you see big chunks of stuff in it? You know, so you're using kind of all your faculties to, to, to look at it and examine it. I mean, they actually have over the counter compost maturity tests now you can <laughs> buy when you put compost in a little jar that's airtight uh-huh. and you put a little sensor in there and it measures the emissions from it and kind of gives you an idea if it's mature or not. Um, I, my, my guess is, you know, as time goes on, there's going to be all sorts of those types of things that come on the market, yeah. but the old tried and true go out there and look at it and examine yeah. it probably works too. <laughs> so you mentioned, you know, we keep mentioning heat and heat and you said when it drops down to 80, but what is, I mean, is there a good temperature it should be? What What are we aiming for? So, you know, if you're have if you have a hot compost pile, you will likely, if you've you kind of you know done everything right you will likely get in the 100 to 130 to 160 degree range as it's cooking okay so wow. it can it can go up and down in that range based on the oxygen content so that's what i was talking about before about okay you took the temperature and it just fell mm-hmm. five degrees turn it and it goes back up right so yeah it can bounce around in that range okay. but when it starts to consistently go down right 120 110 90. Okay. This is becoming mature. The organisms have, have eaten all their food, if you will. And their population is starting to dwindle because there's not more food. And so really the point where it is the same temperature as the outside temperature is where it's, it's pretty much ready at that okay. point. You know, it's not, it's not going to do anything at that point, unless you add more raw materials to it. Okay. Right? I don't know. So, it felt like it, it was 130 this year outside. So almost the same temperature yeah. as the compost, but we got, we got pretty close. That's true. <laughs> yeah. We did have some pretty high heat this year. That's yes. for sure. Especially for multiple days too. Yes. Um, Sorry. So I feel like I should you. also mention <laughs> uh-huh. that, you know, we, we, uh, like I said earlier, the overwhelming majority of people are doing cold composting. So I, I should probably switch and talk a little bit about mm-hmm. that. Yeah, for well. sure. Yeah. So in a cold compost pile, you are adding material as it becomes available. 
So your kitchen scraps, your yard waste, but you're adhering to equal uh, browns and greens as you're going along. That is such a crucial part and will make compost successful for everybody. So over time, as, a, as you add to the top, compost forms at the bottom, right? Mm -hmm. And so I always wondered for years upon years when I was first getting into composting, why commercial compost bins had a little door, a little, a little, you know, trap door at the bottom. And, and I said, what could that be for? What's that little door for at the bottom? Well, now, of course I know that's to harvest the compost that's sitting at the bottom that you can't really access without mixing up mm -hmm. the raw stuff with the compost. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the thing that people need to realize about cold composting is it's a proper way to recycle organic materials. However, if your goal is to create high volumes of compost itself, you're, you're not going to get there with that method. You're only going to get small amounts out of the bottom of the pile every couple months, right? Yeah. So it works. Don't mm -hmm. get me wrong. I don't want to tell people not to do cold composting and to focus on hot composting, but they need to really be aware that it's not a, you know, a machine cranking out a bunch of compost like the hot method is. Yeah. I have a friend, she's a, a fabulous gardener and she has the land for it. And she just has all these piles and she has them in these perforated, um, like circular, uh, tubes. Um, mm -hmm. and she just has tons of cold compost piles around and just periodically she's like, okay, let's go see. And, you know, we'll, we would scoop the top off with a fork, move it on onto a new one. And then down below would be, you know, at most maybe yeah. a foot on a good day of compost because she really wasn't measuring everything and she was just letting it passively happen. But she had so many piles going. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like most people's and, backyard and, size just to get some compost. Yeah. And so you're totally right on that. You could multiply the number of cold compost piles mm -hmm. so that when you do harvest, you're actually harvesting a good volume. That's totally, you know, valid. Um, I was, I was going to say something, but I lost. Oh, it. I was going to say, but she needed a lot. I mean, it still wasn't volume that would, you know, really do much. So, you know, I think for her, it was more of like, this is what I'm doing with the material. It's not ending up in the landfill. I'm super busy. I yeah. don't have time to prep. So I'm just going to do, I have the space. I'm just going to do all these, these cold, cold piles and see what happens. Um, yeah. So I think she would bring and in supplement. Thing, I, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt Oh, that's you. okay. I think um, she'd bring in supplemental compost as well, too. Yeah. So one thing that's really important too that I don't want to forget to mention about cold composting is that, you know, in a hot compost pile, when you put food scraps in there, you don't have a lot of critter issues mm -hmm. because the high heat keeps them away. But I have to admit in a cold compost pile, when you add those food scraps, you mm -hmm. can attract critters, right? Mm, yeah. And so in that case, I, I do tell people that there's a Another option, which is to only use yard waste in your backyard compost pile and use a worm composting system, a worm bin for your fruit and vegetable scraps. So I, I do workshops up in Tahoe, for example, and a lot of people say, well, we can't put food scraps in our compost piles. The bears will come. And yeah. so I say, yes, that's true. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> but if you just have yard waste... They're not going to be attracted to that. So, you know, utilize an outdoor yard waste compost pile and then under your house and your garage have a worm bin to deal with those uh, uh, vegetable and fruit scraps and coffee grounds and things like that. So that's just another option. No, no, that's, a, that's a very good point. One for the bears. I didn't even think about. I mean, obviously, I don't live in bear country, but yeah, for the rodents, a lot of people are already tired of them coming in and eating your fruit. So why encourage yes. them to come in unless, you know, they go to your compost bin instead, but you don't really want rats in there and rat droppings. Um, yeah, and in some cases, these homeowners associations actually um, restrict that. So they actually will say, if you want to compost, you have to buy this composter that is rodent proof, or you have to create a rodent proof 
compost bin. So there is some concern in suburban areas that if people kind of willy-nilly start throwing fruit and vegetable scraps mm-hmm. in their compost piles, you, you could cause a rodent problem, yeah. really, truly. So Yeah, truly. Yeah. Ugh, gross. Uh, <laughs> um, we sort of talk generally about what goes in, the browns and the greens. Um, what are some definitely don't put in your compost bin? That's a great question. Now, I'm kind of wearing my University of California hat here. Uh-huh. So <laughs> they they may have a little bit more okay. of a, okay. a, strict, uh, a strict, you know, palette of materials to avoid. Um, first of all, decomposition just happens, right? Mm-hmm. So you and I are having this conversation outside, decomposition is happening. Um, so all these organic materials will decompose. It's just that some materials can cause us headaches and cause problems. So I'm not saying that these materials will not decompose. I'm just saying they're probably best not added to a compost pile. So let's give some examples. Mm -hmm. Number one, any plant that reproduces from pieces of itself. Yes. (laughs) So so the ultimate example is Bermuda grass. Most people know that, right? If you put a bunch of Bermuda grass in a compost pile, it's very likely you're going to end up with Bermuda grass in your finished compost, right? So so you got to be really careful about plants that propagate easily from pieces of themselves. Succulents, for example, is what most people think of when they think of that. Mm -hmm. Um, If they're not, you know, if they don't know Bermuda grass. Oh. Um, <laughs> Sorry, it's yeah. like, ah, not Bermuda, no. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, some other things to keep out would be, you know, if you absolutely know that you have a diseased plant, um, you know, and you're not doing hot composting, hot composting can handle some of the plant pathogens and weed seeds and things like that. But coal piles, if you have diseased plants, you probably don't want to put them in there mm-hmm. because that, those pathogens could potentially persist. Um, Weed seeds, I just mentioned, if you know you have a bunch of, you know, weed seeds, things that weeds that have gone to seed, you probably want to separate the seed heads from the material. You can put the material on there, the the body of the plant, if you will. But if you're putting a bunch of seeds in there and it's a cold pile, they're going to sprout wherever you put that finished compost. Mm -hmm. Um, Another one is pet waste. And this is a big one because most people want to take their dog and cat pet waste and put it in their piles. Um, And the University of California does not recommend that. Um, And it's really more of a cautionary situation because there there can be um, pathogens in our pet waste that we can inhale or, um, and it can cause problems, health problems for us. So the general guideline is to not actually put your dog and cat waste in a backyard compost pile. So those are some examples of things to avoid. Okay. I, and I know it's like, you know, there's some, some of the, the, it's almost like moderation because you could do fireplace ashes, but you don't want to do all fireplace <laughs> ashes as your brown material, you know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. correct. That, that's a really good point is, is it sounds weird, right? Everything in moderation, but it is kind of true. Like even if you, let's say you had a huge orange tree and, and you ended up making gallons upon gallons of orange juice for your neighborhood and you end up with a huge barrel of orange peels. Well, guess what? An overabundance of orange peels is mm-hmm. going to make decomposition in your pile go very slow because of the materials those peels are made of. They just break down slowly. And so, so you're right. And an absolute excess of any one material may hang up decomposition and make it a little bit more difficult to go quickly. Yeah. So good point. Um, what about kitchen oils? So in general, if you're going to put kitchen oils out there, um, like, you know, scrape a plate or, or, or put any type of fat in there, it, it's best to be in a hot pile okay. because in a cold pile, again, you're just going to attract critters with that type of material. Um, so, you know, in a cold pile, the best thing to do is when you go out um, to your pile and dump whatever you're dumping is from your kitchen is you bury it in the center of the pile. So I mentioned when you go out and, and dump, you also cover with browns. Well, that's, that's great. 
But if you really know that you have some fats and oils in there um, or some extremely sweet stuff um, that may attract ants or something, then open up the middle of the pile with a fork and put it in there and then cover it back up. And that will at least create a buffer to help keep the odors away from some of these critters. Okay. Um, Gosh, I have so many questions still. <laughs> still more things to go through if we've got time. But, you know, I know people want to yeah. add mycorrhizae. They want to add a compost starter. Um, Those not necessary if you go about doing everything sort of properly? Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. So, you know, most of those products are absolutely unnecessary if you're building and managing a compost pile the correct way. Because let's not forget, and, and this may make some of your listeners a little squeamish, but the food that we eat is covered in microorganisms. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, those scraps that you're adding to the pile, they're already there. You know, you don't have to add them. Um, In some cases, if a pile is kind of hung up, like I get questions on the rot line, I thought I did everything right. It just doesn't seem to be decomposing. I'm not doing hot composting. I'm doing cold, but I'm just, nothing seems to be happening. In those cases, I usually suggest a little bit more nitrogen material to kind of kickstart the pile. Okay. So I, if, if anything, if anyone was going to use something to kind of re-energize or kickstart a pile, I would say it would be a high nitrogen source Um, would be the best choice. Like you can get some chicken manure or, you know, get some um, cottonseed meal or alfalfa meal or, you know, uh, food, fruit and vegetable scraps, coffee grounds. Um, I think that would be better to, to kind of give it a push than any of these other products. Okay. Those are free. Got it. Uh, um, And then two things that come to mind as well that I've even gotten questions on is the printing on cardboard. Is that safe? Like dyes? Is that so every I get this question a lot? And, yeah. and all of the inks, pretty much at this point across our whole nation, believe it or not, are soy based inks. Huh. So, okay. as far as the actual like newsprint and, and even the color on newsprint, you're good to go. Okay. The problem arises with the shiny stuff. Mm-hmm. So, the varnish, like um, you know, ad inserts yes. in a newspaper or something like that, right? Or the plastic of an envelope or, you know, I don't think, I haven't never seen any research that links that material to some crazy human health issue, but it's probably a good idea to avoid those things in a compost pile because I could see them accumulating. There are heavy metals involved in those materials. And so in general, wearing my UC hat, we do not recommend putting those shiny ads and things in a compost pile. Okay. No, those, yeah, I do get that question a lot. And I'm usually like, well, I think most, you know, I'm talking cardboard. Most of the ink is pretty biodegradable, but I'm like, I'm not hundred percent sure. Cause it, who knows what companies are using what and, and, um, and so what are some of the strange things you could put in a compost bin that people don't think about? Okay. This is going to be fun. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mentioned dryer lint earlier uh-huh. and that's yeah. kind of a, 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 when I get a question about that all the time. And, you know, obviously there's a mix of, of, of materials in dryer lint. Most of it is probably uh, strands of cotton fibers, but there could be some polyester fibers and things like that that are a little bit tougher to break down. But in general, you're safe with dryer lint. Um, now, I got a question one time about old champagne. Yes, what? believe it or not, <laughs> on the rot line, I got a phone call and a person uh, dug out a case of old champagne out of their basement and said, Can I pour it on my compost pile? And I what? thought, Did Now, they taste this has got to be the most unique question ever. And I told them, sure, why not? The microbes will be happy. And to be truthful, I have no idea if that's true, but I think it turned out okay. <laughs> I'm just like, did they? I, does champagne go bad? Good question. I really, I really don't know. But I don't their, know. From their perspective, it was bad. So uh, okay, maybe I'm I hoping said, well, they tasted it first. I'm sure there's people out there who definitely or no. I mean, wine. But I would have tasted it first. And not just yeah. assumed. I mean, but yeah, yeah, maybe. I, I would agree with that. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Oh, they that, that they decided that that's what they wanted to do with it. Pour it on their compost pile. Yeah. Oh, how that's a funny one. Yeah. I've heard people putting like jeans, but 
that sounds like a slow compost where you then just keep moving these slow breaking down materials to another pile to another pile because that's going to take forever to break down. You know, like, you know, it's funny because a lot of people uh, ask me about that too, like cotton t shirts, uh-huh. right? Things that you know that are going to break down. Yeah, you can put them in a compost pile. And there's actually kind of a funny um, thing where uh, you, you have, believe it or not, you can look this up. People can Google this or um, check it out that you can bury cotton underwear in a in a soil environment and depending on how long it takes for that cotton piece of underwear to disappear it gives you some idea of the soil microorganism activity in the soil i think i, <laughs> I read that yeah i think really crazy yes. but um people do it and i mean like farmers and and researchers so, i'm going to do that <laughs> yeah. i've heard that i think i've, I've your heard that somewhere my microbial activity with yeah. some cotton under it. yeah oh my gosh too funny i yeah, mark where you buried it cuz I, I would forget but like dang it i buried it somewhere i can't remember <laughs> where <It's> so true <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah good point good yeah. point you I, know i get questions about plastics yeah. and 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 these whole, the, all these compostable products, mm. you know, you can now buy, you know, forks and knives that are quote compostable plates, cups, things like that. They appear to the eye almost like, like a plastic product, yeah. Um, but, but they do break down, but they take a long time. And so this isn't, it's not that you couldn't add those. Um, it's just that in a, in a cold pile situation, which like I said, is the majority of people, um, those are those could take multiple, you know, years if in some cases to fully break down and be totally unrecognizable. In a hot compost situation, they're going to break down faster, but maybe not even in one pile. Yeah, sort of um, like corn so, corn cobs. How fast do corn cobs break down in a hot pile? So I've actually done a little experiment on this, believe uh, it or not, uh. where I had two hot compost piles. I tried to get my daughter in, interested in this as kind of like a science fair type project, but it, it didn't garner too much interest. It was it was a, it was a dad <laughs> scientific. It became yeah. your project. Yeah. Totally. So I put a full corn cob in one in the middle of the pile, and then I chopped one up um, into about half inch kind of pieces um, and put it in the other. It's pretty obvious what happened, right? Mm -hmm. So at the end of the pile, you have a very small, but completely intact corn cob on the, on one side. And then the other pile, you can't find a corn cob for the life of you. It's completely broken down. So the more you chop things up, the more surface area there, there is for these microorganisms. And so um, uh, whole items like a full corn cob are just going to take double, triple the amount of time because microbes can't get at them, um, can't get into the inside quickly. Whereas when you chop it up, they can cover all the surfaces and break it down quickly. And this also is very pertinent to oak leaves and pine needles. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think you cannot add oak leaves or pine needles in a compost pile. And that is a myth. Even, you know, I mean, all sorts of plant material can be added to compost piles because it all decomposes. It's just a matter of chopping them up, right? Because oak leaves and pine needles have that waxy cuticle that that makes it difficult for microbes to get into the, quote, meat of the pine needle. They have to wait for that waxy cuticle to kind of biodegrade with, you know, wind and water and sun before they can get in there. And so when you chop up oak leaves and pine needles, you give them an entrance point and you'll be amazed at how fast they disappear in a pile once you do that. Okay. That's a really good point. Cause I mean, you do hear that people like, oh, you can't put those in, in, I think they're more concerned like, oh, it's going to cause too much tannins or it's going to make it, but all this stuff is breaking down. It's all breaking down. So it, but it's a good point to break this stuff as small as possible. I mean, you don't need to, but if you're trying to do the hot compost and get a decent amount faster than that sounds like the way to go. Speaking of fast, I do want to talk about these. I think they're new compost, like accelerated compost bins people are buying. Yes. I mean, we definitely should talk about these. This is super interesting. Yeah. So, you know, I've read nothing about them. All I know is it's like, well, how can you speed up the the process. It's a natural, you know, breakdown of microorganisms. So what, what, what is your thoughts and, and let people know why it's probably not the best way to go. 
So there's two products on the market that are being used in the house. Okay. I mean, worm bins have always been used mm-hmm. kind of indoors. Um, and that's, that's strictly for your food scraps. You have these red wigglers, you put them in a bedding material in a bin, you make sure they have air and moisture and you feed them their scraps. They eat those scraps and they, their poop is worm castings, which is probably the best soil amendment on the face of the earth. So, so worm bins aside, there's two other ways you can do composting in house. One is called Bokashi and Bokashi method is involves a a bucket basically um, that you put all your food scraps in. So you could put meat and dairy and and fruit and vegetable scraps and coffee grounds, anything you put all in there and you add the, this little packet of inoculated bran and it, and it's a special patented formula of microorganisms called effective microorganisms, EM. And so you add these or freeze dried (laughs) organisms to your Bokashi bucket and they consume the material over time right there um, in, a, in a very odorless manner. But the end product isn't compost. Mm-hmm. It's kind of a broken down, halfway broken down material that they then recommend you take and put out and bury in the soil somewhere or in put it in a compost pile outdoors. So it's not really creating finished compost. And in the same way, the other product on the market, which are these kind of high tech uh, composting machines um, that you plug in and use electricity, Mm. they also don't produce an actual compost product at the end. You still have to either bury it in the soil or put it into a compost pile to decompose it further. But what these high tech um, things do is they use heat, a heat element, and a grinder. So it, they're grinding the material and they're heating it up really fast to dehydrate it. And so sometimes you'll see steam coming out of these things. That's all the water Uh being kind of pulled out um, from the material. So what you end up with isn't compost. You end up with dehydrated, chopped up (laughs) material. (laughs) Oh my Which gosh. It's fine if you're if if that works for you and you you live in an apartment and mm-hmm. then you yeah. maybe put that material in green waste, at least you're at least you're shrinking the material and getting it it on its way to decomposition. Yeah. Okay. And it sounds like maybe these companies are being a little honest and saying that this isn't fully compost. This is what you need to do next. Maybe at least the first one says go out now and put it in you the know, compost bin. You know, it's kind of funny because not necessarily in their the name of the product uh, or how they're marketing it, but when it. you get the instructions, uh, they're very clear in there that what the end product is is not finished compost. It got is it. A material that still needs further breaking down. Yeah, that second one just sounds crazy. We're just gonna grind this and dry it out. So it's like <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, and it's just exactly. here, here, here's your here's your dust now of your kitchen waste. <laughs> Do what you want yeah. with it. Uh, well, you know, like like, like I you said, said, for some people maybe that's yeah. that's good. Maybe you know because they could. The, the cool thing about those two in house products, the Bokashi and the high tech, you know, uh-huh. there's different brands, and the only one that I know the brand name on is Lomi, and I don't know if that it's appropriate to to say the brand name, but um, I'm not recommending it. Yeah. I don't work for them or yeah. anything, uh, but. Um, what I know is that, you know, you can put anything in those systems. So meat, dairy, you know, scrape your plate in them. And so that does make them attractive to people who really aren't into composting. They're like, oh, this is great. I can put mm-hmm. everything in there. And sure, it doesn't make compost, but it makes something that is much smaller in volume. And I can go out and sprinkle it in my yard or yeah. you know, bury it in the soil. Okay. Yeah, I could see that. I could see for sure because it's still going back into the garden and it's it's not going in the garbage can. And yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I could see that. Okay. But yeah, I just I think people are starting to think, "Oh, it's instant compost." Um and that's that, not the case. Yeah, that's not the case. Um one last thing is people don't need a fancy compost bin. Um True. And are there any that I mean, people may not like the look of a compost pile, so they have these bins that you turn, um, but they don't sound like they're big enough. If you're doing hot compost, five by five by five, I've seen those. Those aren't big enough. And then if you're doing just passive composting, uh, 
unless you're, you know, accumulating and creating very small amounts, that's not even going to be big enough. So is there any time that you do recommend a compost bin besides just laying it on the ground? Yeah, you know, that it's so true. So, you know, if you're an organic farmer and you have a compost pile, you, you don't, you likely don't have any bin. Mm-hmm. You don't have any walls around it. You just have yeah. a big open pile. Yeah. And you're right. Yeah. People can do that in their own backyard. It's just fine. It's just that it's not aesthetically pleasing. Mm-hmm. It's, it, it can kind of spread out as it decomposes. And so a lot of people like to have it organized in, in one area of the yard and you can make your own compost bins out of very inexpensive materials for very low cost, if not free. Um, you know, some people just use field fencing and T posts. Um, there are, inexpensive compost bins on the market. You mentioned one earlier that is made of black plastic Mm -hmm. with a bunch of holes in it. Um, Really inexpensive, works fine. And then of course they jump way up in cost, um, you know, in the hundred dollar range, I call these commercial compost bins. Um, And many of them aren't even at least three by three by three to make hot compost. You're right on point there. So if you wanted to hot compost with most of these expensive bins, they're not even big enough to do so. Um, So there are some on the market that are, don't get me wrong. Um, I like compost bins that are termed stackable. And so they, I like the ones, if you're going to buy one that come in sections. So you kind of, you build the pile in there and when you have to turn it, you can take off the top section. It can become a bottom section and you can just turn it right into that Mm. next to it and just kind of shift the the bin from side to side. Um, The only, the biggest thing to consider is that number one, they're aesthetically pleasing for you right? Because that's a big thing. Like a lot of people aren't going to put some big, bright green plastic (laughs) compost pile in their yard because they don't like how it looks. They want a a very kind of discreet black one that they can hide into in a corner, right? So that's definitely a consideration. There's no doubt. But the size of it, depending on if you're going to do cold or hot composting is a consideration. The cost of it is a consideration. And I would say the rodent resistance is a consideration if you live in a development, which most likely would have some rules about the type of compost bin you can have. Most of those rules include a tight fitting lid, whereas there's many composters that don't have tops. And so you need, you know, they usually say tight fitting lid, less than quarter inch spaces around the the walls. And then many of them don't even have bottoms, which of course doesn't make it rodent proof. So many times you have to add, you know, hardware cloth on the bottom just to keep rats or rodents from coming in the bottom. So I think those are all important considerations to make. Um, But no, you're absolutely right. You don't even need a bin if you don't want one. You can do this in an open pile in your backyard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is great. I've I've learned a lot, and I think people are going to really be interested in this. Uh, just knowing the difference between the cold and the hot, and then um, basically the measuring out of the the materials. Is there? Um, do you recommend? You guys have a site up there um, that people could go and learn more about composting. You do workshops. Is that only open for um, county residents? No, not at all. Open to, to anyone. Okay. Um, and so, and we actually, because of COVID time, we have recorded mm. ones that are available on our website too. So from the, you know, comfort of your home, you can listen to more about composting. Um, so, you know, I, I oversee the Placer County Master Gardener Group and the Nevada County Master Gardener Group. Both groups have websites and you can just use the search engine of your choice, put in Placer County Master Gardens, you'll find their site. Um, and, and there's composting information and there's recorded workshops on composting on both of their websites. And really overall, to, no matter what county you live in, most likely there's a neighboring Master Gardener program that has composting information mm-hmm. as well. Yeah, Most point. Of the programs, when master gardeners go through their volunteer training, have a real heavy compost element to it. And so most master gardeners should be very knowledgeable in the realm of composting as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Most, like you said, every county has their county extension and their master gardeners that are, I don't know if all of them have a rot line though. 
<laughs> no, that, that makes me a little special, I guess. Um, so I will say anyone, and I mean anyone listening to your po- podcast anywhere, is wel- welcome to call me on my rot line. Oh. The number is 1530 889 7399. Oh, girl. All right. Wow. You gave out the rot line. So can you yeah. believe I did? Yeah. yeah. So, Wait till I yeah. tell you the calls I get now. Uh, yeah. Th- yeah. There might be someone who's like, oh, well, I've got some like old, uh, old cores light. Can I dump that out there? <laughs> You just get all these out. I think from my answer will be what you said. Well, try it first. Can you try it first? (laughs) Or it's like, I I made some bad moonshine. Can I put that in there? Yeah. Yeah, You know, to be honest, you know, the alcohol is probably not very friendly to those microorganisms. But, you know, unless you were dumping an extreme amount, I can't yeah. imagine. Really but maybe if it's for, like gone to some way where it's just like the sugars now and they're just chewing it up and love it. I don't know. Yeah, yeah so it de- true. depends on where it's at. I think champagne does go bad. I think. I don't know. It sounds like a future University of California experiment, yeah. doesn't it? Like <laughs> we should know what the effect of old champagne and liquor on compost piles is. Yeah, <laughs> they're looking around. They're like, who drank the experimental champagne? Oops. <laughs> we thought that was the celebratory champagne after our experiment was done. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, this was great. Like I said, I learned so much. I'll have the um, the websites in the show notes. And of course, everyone, I'll post this um, information on Instagram and my Facebook, Marlene the Plant Lady. Um, but until next time, everyone, happy gardening. <laughs>